in three, part four and three. I didn't get all the testimony. Once more, I've got a life to live other than sitting in front of the TV screen. Uh, I've been busy doing some things. Besides that, my battery run low. Uh, my phone fell. My battery run low. Um, it's just entirely too much jibber-jabber to me towards what's going on and one pointing the finger at the other. But anyways, uh, let's hear the ending results for today that are now coming to an end of today's hearings pertaining to the Nanny Nanny Boo Boo hearings. And let's uh, hear a bit of what he's got to say here at the very end. None of us here really know because the accusations change. Let's back it up, 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 stop. With all the previous witnesses who they bizarrely consider as their star witnesses. When you look through the presumptions, assumptions, and smoke and mirrors, you see the facts of this case are clear. President Trump was skeptical of foreign aid generally, and especially skeptical of aid to corrupt countries like Ukraine. He wanted to discover the facts about Ukrainian meddling in the 2016 election against his campaign. A brief hold on Ukrainian aid was lifted without Ukraine taking any steps they were supposedly being bribed to do. President Zelensky repeatedly said there was nothing improper about President Trump's call with him, and he did not even know about the hold in aid at the time he was supposedly being extorted with it. Naturally, he didn't know it because he had been running for uh, the president. He was too involved in other affairs. Besides that, he didn't know the fundamentals about various contracts with the United States at that particular point in time because he had yet to become president. Come on. So what exactly are the Democrats impeaching the president for? None of us here really know. You probably don't. Because the accusations change by the hour. Oh, really? Once again, this is impeachment in search of a crime. So, Chairman, I would urge you to bring this to a close, to adjourn this hearing, and move on, and get back to the work of the Intelligence Committee. That, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Today we are joined by Ambassador David Hale and Ms. Laura Cooper. David Hale serves as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs for the Department of State, a position he has held since August 30, 2018. Mr. Hale joined the Foreign Service in 1984 and holds the rank of Career Ambassador. He previously served as the Ambassador to Pakistan, Ambassador to Lebanon, Special Envoy for Middle East Peace, Deputy Special Envoy, and Ambassador to Jordan. Ambassador Hale also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and Executive Assistant to Secretary of State Albright. Laura Cooper is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia at the Department of Defense. She is a career member of the Senior Executive Service. Ms. Cooper previously served as a Principal Director in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security Affairs. Prior to joining the Department of Defense in 2001, Ms. Cooper was a policy planning officer at the State Department in the Office of Co Coordinator of Counterterrorism. Two final points, uh, points before witnesses are sworn. First, witness depositions as part of this inquiry were unclassified in nature, and all open hearings will also be held at the unclassified level. Any information that may touch on classified information will be addressed separately. And second, Congress will not tolerate any reprisal, threat of reprisal, or attempt to retaliate against any U.S. government official for testifying before Congress, including you or any of your colleagues. If you would both please rise and raise your right hand, I'll begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you, and please be seated. The microphone is sensitive, so please speak directly into it. Without objection, your written statements so will be made part of the record. With that, uh, Ambassador Hale, if you have an uh, opening statement, you're free to give that. And immediately thereafter, uh, Ms. Cooper, you are recognized for your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I, um, I don't have a prepared opening statement, but I would like to just uh, 
comment, of course, uh, as, as you said, I've been undersecretary since August of 2018, a foreign service officer for over 35 years, an ambassador three times, serving both Republican and Democratic administrations proudly, and uh, I'm here in response to your subpoena to answer the questions of the committee. Thank you, Undersecretary. Uh, Ms. Cooper. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of this committee, I appear today to provide facts and answer questions based on my experience as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. I would first like to describe my background as well as my role and vantage point relevant to your inquiry. I bring to my daily work and to this proceeding my sense of duty to U.S. national security, not to any political party. I have proudly served two Democratic and two Republican presidents. I entered government service through the Presidential Management Internship Competition, joining the State Department in 1999 to work on counterterrorism in Europe and the former Soviet Union. Inspired by working with the U.S. military on a Department of Defense rotational assignment, I decided to accept a civil service position in the policy organization of the Office of the Secretary of Defense in January 2001, where I have remained for the past 18 years. My strong sense of pride in serving my country and dedication to my Pentagon colleagues were cemented in the moments after I felt the Pentagon shake beneath me on September 11, 2001. My office was scheduled to move into the section of the Pentagon that was destroyed in the attack, but a construction delay meant that we were still at our old desks in the adjacent section on that devastating day. After we had wiped the black dust from our desks and tried to get back to work, I found meaning by volunteering to work on Afghanistan policy and would give my next four years to this mission. I later had the opportunity to move into the leadership ranks of my organization and have had the privilege to manage issues ranging from defense strategic planning to homeland defense and mission assurance. I accepted the position of principal director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia in 2016 and was honored to be appointed formally to the position of Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in 2018. In my current role, I work to advance U.S. national security with a focus on deterring Russian aggression and building strong partnerships with the frontline states of Ukraine and Georgia, as well as 10 other allies and partners from the Balkans to the Caucasus. Strengthening Ukraine's That's capacity to defend itself against Russian aggression is central to my team's mission. The United States and our allies provide Ukraine with, this, with security assistance because it is in our national security interest to deter Russian aggression around the world. We exactly. also provide security assistance so that Ukraine can negotiate a peace with Russia from a position of strength. The human toll continues to climb in this ongoing war, with 14,000 Ukrainian lives lost since Russia's 2014 invasion. These sacrifices are continually in my mind as I lead DOD efforts to provide vital training and equipment, including defensive lethal assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces. I have also supported a robust Ukrainian Ministry of Defense program of defense reform to ensure the long-term sustainability of U.S. investments and the transformation of the Ukrainian military from a Soviet model to a NATO interoperable force. The National Defense Authorization Act requires the Department of Defense to certify defense reform progress to release half of the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, or USAI, funds a provision we find very helpful. Based on recommendations from me and other key DOD advisors, the Department of Defense, in coordination with the Department of State, certified in May 2019 that Ukraine had, quote, taken substantial actions to make defense institutional reforms for the purposes of decreasing corruption, increasing accountability, and sustaining improvements of combat capability, unquote meriting obligation of the entire $250 million in USAI funds. This brings me to the topic of today's proceedings. I would like to recap my recollection of the timeline in which these events played out. I testified about all of this at length in my deposition. In July, I became aware of a hold being placed on obligation 
of the State Department's Foreign Military Financing, or FMF, and DOD's USAI funds. In a series of interagency meetings, I heard that the President had directed the Office of Management and Budget to hold the funds because of his concerns about corruption in Ukraine. Let me say at the outset that I have never discussed this or any other matter with the President and never heard directly from him about this matter. At a senior level meeting I attended on July 26, chaired by National Security Council leadership, as at all other interagency meetings on this topic of which I was aware, the national security community expressed unanimous support for resuming the funding as in the U.S. national security interest. At the July 26th meeting, there was also a discussion of how Ukrainian anti-corruption efforts were making progress. DOD reiterated what we had said in our earlier certification to Congress, stating that sufficient progress in defense reform, including anti-corruption, had occurred to justify the USAI spending. I and others at the interagency meetings felt that the matter was particularly urgent because it takes time to obligate that amount of money, and my understanding was that the money was legally required to be obligated by September 30th, the end of the fiscal year. In the ensuing weeks until the hold was released on September 11th, I pursued three tracks. First, starting on July 31st at an interagency meeting, I made clear to the interagency leadership my understanding that once DOD reaches the point at which it does not have sufficient time to obligate all the funding by the end of the fiscal year, there were only two ways to discontinue obligation of USAI, a president-directed rescission or a DOD-directed reprogramming action, either of which would need to be notified to Congress. I never heard that either was being pursued. Second, I was in communication with the DOD Security Assistance Implementing Community to try to understand exactly when they would reach the point at which they would be unable to obligate all the funds by the end of the fiscal year. I received a series of updates, and in a September 5th update, I and other senior Defense Department leaders were informed that over 100 million could not be obligated by September 30th. And third, I was advocating for a meeting of the cabinet level principals with the president to explain why the assistance should go forward. Although I heard of attempts to discuss the issue with the president, I never received details about any conversations other than a status update that the hold had not been lifted. After the decision to release the funds on September 11th of this year, my colleagues across the DOD security assistance enterprise work tirelessly to be able to ultimately obligate about 86% of the funding by the end of the fiscal year, more than they had originally estimated they would be able to. Due to a provision in September's continuing resolution appropriating an amount equal to the unobligated funds from fiscal year 2019, we ultimately will be able to obligate all of the USAI funds. Given how critical these funds are for bolstering Ukraine's security and deterring Russia, I appreciate this congressional action. That concludes my opening statement, but before answering your questions, there is one other matter I would like to address. Which is? I testified in a deposition before this committee and other committees on October 23rd, 2019. At that time, I was asked questions about what I knew about when the Ukrainian government may have learned about any hold on security assistance funds. I answered those questions based on my knowledge at that time. Since my deposition, I have again reviewed my calendar, and the only meeting where I recall a Ukrainian official raising the issue with me is on September 5th at the Ukrainian Independence Day celebration. I have, however, since learned some additional information about this subject from my staff. Prior to my deposition testimony, I avoided discussing my testimony with members of my staff or anyone other than my attorney to ensure that my deposition testimony was based only on my personal knowledge. My deposition testimony was publicly released on November 11th, 2019. Members of my staff read the testimony and have come to me since then and provided additional information. 
Specifically, on the issue of Ukraine's knowledge of the hold or of Ukraine asking questions about possible issues with the flow of assistance, my staff showed me two unclassified emails that they received from the State Department. One was received on July 25th at 2.31 p.m. That email said that the Ukrainian Embassy and House Foreign Affairs Committee are asking about security assistance. The second email was received on July 25th at 4.25 p.m. That email said that The Hill knows about the FMF situation to an extent, and so does the Ukrainian Embassy. I did not receive either of these emails. My staff does not recall informing me about them, and I do not recall being made aware of their content at the time. I do not have any additional information about precisely what the Ukrainians may have said, what may have been their source of information about a hold or any possible issues with the flow of assistance, or what the State Department officials may have told them. My staff also advised me in the last few days of the following additional facts that may be relevant to this inquiry. Again, my staff does not recall informing me about them, and I do not recall being made aware of this. On July 3rd at 4.23 p.m., they received an email from the State Department stating that they had heard that the CN is currently being blocked by OMB. This apparently refers to the congressional notification state would send for Ukraine FMF. I have no further information on this. On July 25th, a member of my staff got a question from a Ukraine embassy contact asking what was going on with Ukraine security assistance. Because at that time, we did not know what the guidance was on USAI. Uh, the OMB notice of apportionment arrived that day, but the staff member did not find out about it until later. I was informed that the staff member told the Ukrainian official that we were moving forward on USAI, but recommended that the Ukraine embassy check in with state regarding the FMF. Sometime during the week of August 6 to 10, a Ukraine embassy officer told a member of my staff that a Ukrainian official might raise concerns about security assistance in an upcoming meeting. My understanding is that the issue was not in fact raised. Again, I have no further information about what concerns about the security assistance Ukraine may have had at that time. My staff also recall thinking that Ukrainians were aware of the hold on security assistance during August, but they cannot pinpoint any specific conversations where it came up. Uh, my staff told me they are aware of additional meetings where they saw officials from the Ukrainian embassy in August, and they believe that the question of the hold came up at some point. But they told me they did not find any corresponding email or other records of those meetings. Consequently, neither they nor I know precisely when or what additional discussions may have occurred with the Ukrainians in the month of August. If I had more details on these matters, I would offer them to the committee, but this is the extent of additional information I have received since my deposition. Mr. Chairman, I welcome your questions. I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, for this hearing, we will forego the first round of questions uh, by committee counsel and immediately proceed to member questions under the five-minute rule. Um, I do want to respond to uh, the comments of my uh, ranking member, however, um, that I think suggested that this was a surprise to the minority. We informed the minority last night um, after our hearing that we would, because of the nature of the testimony today, we did not believe that a staff member round was necessary. Um, and the message we got back from the minority was, okay, got it, thanks for the heads up. Um, so the minority was uh, on notice. It raised no objection about uh, going directly to member rounds. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, um, the minority has represented that we have not called any minority witnesses. Uh, that is not accurate. Um, Mr. Hale appears tonight as a minority witness. Uh, I know that's not how you characterize yourself, Mr. Hill, but your testimony was requested by the minority. Likewise, uh, two of the witnesses yesterday, uh, Master Volker, uh, as well as Mr. Morrison, were both minority requested witnesses. Now, Mr. Volker, Master Volker testified that uh, he didn't believe any of the allegations against Joe Biden, uh, and in retrospect that he should have understood that an investigation into Burisma was really an investigation into Biden. Uh, which he acknowledged would be inappropriate. Uh, and Mr. Morrison gave testimony as to uh, conversations that he had 
with Ambassador Sondman um, about the conversations that he had relayed to the Ukrainians about the hold and security assistance being a result of the failure to secure the investigation. So I can understand why the minority does not want to now characterize them as minority requested witnesses, but nonetheless, they were minority requested witnesses. I now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. And uh, I want to begin by asking you, uh, Ms. Cooper, about what you just uh, informed us of to make sure that I understand the import of what you're saying. As early as July 25th, uh, the same day President Trump spoke with President Zelensky on the phone and uh, asked for this favor, uh, the same day that President Zelensky thanked the United States for its military support and signaled it was ready to purchase more javelins. On that date, um, you got inquiries, your staff got inquiries from someone at the Ukrainian embassy uh, who was concerned about the status of the military assistance. Is that correct? Sir, that's correct. I would say that specifically the Ukrainian embassy staff asked what is going on with Ukrainian security assistance. And did that uh, connote to you that they were concerned that something was in fact going on with it? Yes, sir. And you received, I guess your staff received more than one inquiry on that date. Uh, what was the other, the nature of the other inquiry on July 25th? Uh, sir, the, that was the one inquiry to my staff, but the other um, points that I had raised were uh, emails reflecting outreach to the State Department. So the Ukrainian embassy was also contacting the State Department to find out about uh, its portion of military assistance? Yes, sir. And was that similarly uh, a concern about what's going on with our military aid? It was similarly a question about what, what's going on with security assistance. And your staff or one of the other department staff also heard in August uh, additional inquiries uh, from the Ukraine embassy about a potential holdup in the military assistance? Sir, I want to be careful about how I phrase this. Uh, my staff recall having had meetings with Ukrainian embassy representatives during the month of August, and they believe that the topic came up at some point during those meetings, but they don't recall the precise date or specifically what the, the nature of the discussion was. But your staff at least gleaned from those conversations that the Ukrainian embassy was aware that there was some kind of a hold uh, on the assistance. Sir, so the way I would phrase it is that there was some kind of an issue. Yes. Um, you are now, Ms. Cooper, the third witness uh, before our committee who has testified that the Ukrainians found out about the problem or a hold on the security assistance prior to it becoming public but you're the first to indicate that that may go back as early as the date of the president's call with President Zelensky. Uh, let me move to a related issue. In August, you testified at your deposition that you met with Kurt Volker, I believe it was on August 20th. The hold on security assistance was still in place. Uh, you testified that Ambassador Volker told you that if he could get Zelensky to make a public statement quote, that would somehow disavow any interference in U.S. elections and would commit to the prosecution of any individuals involved in election interference, it might lift the hold on security assistance. Uh, is that correct? Sir, I believe that I uh, testified that it was my inference that that would uh, lift the hold on Ukraine's security assistance. And that was your inference because at the time you were talking about the hold on security assistance? That's correct. The first part of our conversation was about the hold on security assistance. And it was during that portion of the conversation that he brought up the effort to um, get this public statement? It was during that conversation. I'm not sure I would say it's during that part of the conversation. What else did you discuss in the conversation? The only two topics that I recall are the urgency of lifting the, the hold on security assistance and then him relaying uh, this separate diplomatic effort um, that I had previously been unaware of. Uh, so you didn't have any discussion about any White House meeting? 
Sir, I don't recall specifically talking about the White House meeting, but we I've had many conversations about the desire for the White House meeting. Um, so it's likely that that was a part of the conversation. But the two things you do recall are that you talked about the hold on security assistance and that he brought up this public statement that they wanted Zelensky to get that he thought um, uh, might be useful. That is correct, sir. Mr. Nunes. Mr. Ratcliffe. I want to apologize real quick because of the beetle problem that we're having here in Tennessee, <clears throat> which is once more another indication towards environmental changes going on. Whenever I was growing up as a child, I have never seen autumn or winter beetles, little beady bugs come out the way that they have. And they do it every year, just about this same time of year, because it warms up during this time of year that ordinarily it should be cold. But occasionally you will see a bug crawling around on my TV screen. A beetle. A little bitty beetle. Please do not think nothing of that. Because whenever I open and shut the door, sometimes they get in to my living quarters and it's very difficult for me to eliminate all of them because there's so many of them outside. So if you see one crawling across the TV screen, across somebody's white shirt or somebody's face, please do not think that that is being done intentionally because it is not. And of course, if you swipe the screen with a fly swatter to hit a beetle, you know what it's going to leave. It's going to leave a splatter. Then I got to take time to clean the TV screen, which means that there will be an interference with my recording pertaining to my YouTube channel. So rather than swipe and splat and stop and cut and process uh, with my filming, I rather just do it main my streamlining. I rather just let it. Hopefully, there's another beetle right there. It's on that chair right by that woman's chin, right and almost directly in front of her chin right now. Down below it just a little bit, there's another beetle right there. But there's absolutely nothing that I can do about it at this point in time while I'm filming. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Ambassador Hale, Ms. Cooper, thank you both for being here. Um, in his opening, Ranking Member Nunez uh, referenced President Trump's general skepticism of providing aid uh, and the amount of foreign aid being provided to foreign countries. Uh, would you agree with that characterization, Ambassador Hale? Um, we've often heard at the State Department that uh, the President of the United States wants to make sure that uh, foreign assistance is reviewed scrupulously to make sure that it's in, truly in U.S. national interests and that we evaluate it continuously to the, meet certain criteria that the president's established. And since his election, is it fair to say that President Trump has looked to overhaul how foreign aid is distributed? Yes, the NSC launched a foreign assistance review process uh, sometime, I think it was late August or early September 2018. All right. And throughout both his campaign and his administration, President Trump has repeatedly sought to reframe, uh, reframe American foreign policy in economic terms, and as he described, America first. Uh, policy and consistent with that well before there was a whistleblower talking about a pause on aid to the Ukraine the president had expressed genuine concern about providing US foreign assistance uh, to that point is it fair to say that the president has wanted to ensure the American taxpayer money was being effectively and efficiently spent outside of the United States yes that is the broad intent of the foreign assistance review among other goals and has the president expressed that he expects our allies to give their fair share of foreign aid as evidenced by a point that he raised during the July 25th phone call with President Zelensky to that effect? The principle of greater burden sharing by allies and other like-minded states is an important element of the foreign assistance review. Is it fair to say that in the Trump administration, U.S. aid is withheld from foreign countries for a number of factors? Correct. And you've testified in your prior testimony that it is normal to have delays um, on aid. 
I may have said it that way, but it is certainly an occurrence. It does occur. In the past year, Ukraine was not the only country to have aid withheld uh, from it. Is that correct? Correct. In the past year, was aid held withheld from Pakistan? Yes, sir. Why was aid withheld from Pakistan? Because of unhappiness over the uh, policies and uh, behavior of the Pakistani government toward certain proxy groups that were involved in conflicts with the United States. And in the past year, was aid also withheld from Honduras? Uh, aid was withheld from uh, the three uh, states in Central, Northern and Central America, yes. In the past year, was aid withheld from Lebanon? Uh, yes, sir. And when aid was first held, withheld from, Ebanon, uh, from Lebanon, um, were you given a reason why it was withheld? No. So having no explanation for why aid is being withheld is not uncommon? I would say it is not the normal way that we function. But does happen? It does happen. And is it true that uh, when aid was being withheld from Lebanon, that was at the same time aid was being withheld from Ukraine? Correct, sir. And uh, you've testified that the aid to Lebanon still hasn't been released, is that right? That is correct. All right. But the aid to Ukraine was released on September 11th, correct? Uh, I read that, yes. All right. So it's fair to say that aid has been withheld uh, from several countries across the globe for various reasons, and in some cases for reasons that are still unknown just in the past year. Correct, sir. So um, the assertion has been made that uh, President Trump's Ukraine policy changed uh, when there was a pause in uh, the, the aid, or the aid was withheld. Um, is that an accurate statement? That was not the way I understood things to be happening at the time. We were not given an explanation. And in terms of our policy, in terms of aid to Ukraine, you've described it as very robust. Our aid to Ukraine? Yes. Yes. Um, as evidenced by President Trump's policy decision to provide lethal defensive weapons, Javelin missiles. It was very robust, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and that was a decision that President Trump made that uh, President, the prior administration, President Obama, had not done. Lethal weapons had not been provided to Ukraine in the Obama administration, correct? I was not involved in Ukrainian affairs during the Obama administration, so I don't feel competent to address that. Uh, and when aid to Ukraine was put on pause, I believe you've testified that there may have been concern by Secretary uh, Kent and by Ambassador Taylor that it was contributing to a potentially negative effect on U.S.-Ukraine relations. Do you agree with that? Well, the State Department position was to advocate for the continuation of that assistance uh, as an important element, in fact, a key element of our strategy to support Russia, uh, support the Ukraine against Russia. I want to stop for a minute. I'm sitting here listening to this because this is this is this is a a, a new image of how America does business with international foreign affairs all over the planet. All over the planet. You know, we as individuals live in our little bubbles. We got our families, we got our children, we go to school, we go to work. Then as we get older, we think about retirement and we've got our own personal problems on an individual level. If we're giving away money to three different countries in South America, Afghanistan, Libya, and two or three others that has been mentioned as well as the Ukrainians, or given weapons of mass destruction, weapons of doomsday, basically, scenarios, it pretty much so throws out the door in regard to biblical Bible prophecy that was supposed to have taken on a mainstream occurrence when it took place 30 plus years ago 
in 1988 during Ronald Reagan's administration. Not only did it not take mainstream then, but even to this day, it's still not taken mainstream because we're still funding and giving out weaponry to all these different countries, to all this different chaos. And now, and now, the genie has been let out of the bottle. Pandora's box has been opened to where now we see what kind of affairs that the United States government is in fact partaking and participating in. I have never in my life been so heartbroken as I am by sitting and watching, learning, observing, understanding more and more about the corruption coming from the United States of America. We talk about peace, but yet now we're giving our supplying all these all this weaponry to all these different countries. You talk about a mess. This has turned out to be chaotic. Extremely chaotic in the year 2019. November the 20th. I think it's November the 20th, 2019. Um, Jesus, how come? How come if not the government should have taken the initiative towards supporting the windmill ministries? the Windmill Ministries missions, how come the church world failed to uplift the acknowledgement of the opening of the first seal? Of the two witnesses pertaining to end time biblical Bible prophecy. I mean, I hear a lot of chatter about how that, you know, I think uh, uh, the Heinz 57 man, uh, he, he was big on, on trying to uh, delegate peace and peace talks and stuff like that. And I don't know in what avenue or what angle that, that, they're, that they're working in. I don't know if they're bringing up biblical Bible prophecy. I don't know if they're just flipping it out of their hat towards saying peace, peace. Of course, the Bible says that whenever they shall say peace, 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 and all is well, that sudden destruction will fall upon to them. Well, we talk the talk about peace, but as far as all is well, we're just about as far from all is well, not just here in America, but throughout all these different places that a man is from the moon. We are just about as far from all is well as a man is from the moon. We talked to talk, but no one was willing to walk the walk as far as allowing for the founder of the Windmill Ministries to take center stage, to have that, that dominant uh, influence or that voice. And now, 30 years later, we're seeing the results on account of not doing it like it should have been done. Going all the way back into the Reagan and the Mr. Senior Bush era. I just pray to God that God's will will be done. And that all this will be cleaned up and straightened out within the next few years. Because I can already see that this is creating that much more uncertainty. And anytime you have uncertainty between two 
allies. Now you start having doubt. When you start having doubt, now you start wondering what was he or she or it as an entity up to to begin with. And it becomes not just frustrating, but it becomes dangerous whenever you have such trust issues that now are being eroded and dissolved on account of all of this. You know, the, these are no longer matters that are being handled with the intel community of people that didn't know a daggone thing about nothing of the, nothing about all this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. There was, there's been a lot of it that, that I didn't realize. That I just didn't know uh, went on be, 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 be beyond the curtain. I, I've always known that there was, you know, uh, workhorses and then there's show horses. I've always known that. I just didn't know in detail towards what the workhorse has actually done in different departments for not only the United States, but for other mainstream countries around the world. And now, all of a sudden, this is opening up the eyes of not just myself, but opening up the eyes to probably millions and millions of people. Because if the truth be known, this is probably breaking all-time records as far as people tuning in uh, with ratings. This is probably breaking all-time records all over the planet because of such media exposure that has never been seen before on live TV. All-time records. All-time records. It's bewildering to think that the madness of certain people here in America that literally thought that they could undermine God and undermine God's people, it, 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 it's, it goes beyond just being frustrating to the point that now it's very, very uh, wor worrisome of, of bringing that much more uncertainty to our future and to our children's future and their children's children's future. It's sad. This is a sad way of discovering the truth. It's sad that it has taken 30 years of relentless bickering, badgering, underhanding, manipulating deals to the point that we are now facing a $23 trillion deficit and all the other problems that have miraculously just come out of the blue because all of a sudden everybody and their brother started looking at this towards saying, my God, what have we done? What have we done? Well, I'm going to tell you what we've done. We have put our future, obviously, in the hands of the wrong people. That's what we've done. And because of it, it is going to be devastating for generations to come until we can finally figure out how to resolve these problems. It's become beyond worrisome. It's actually frightful in not knowing from one day to another 
what's going to escalate or who's going to take all this and misconstrue it, misunderstand it, what country is going to be offended because now they're finding out that we was doing this over here and they didn't know about it because everything was being done in secrecy. I mean, it just opens up a brand new can of worms in today's society with the genie being taken out of the bottle. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's frightful, frightfuling, frightful thinking that if this gets into the ears and the eyes of the wrong people, what the consequences could actually be. Whenever it comes to jeopardizing our national security and jeopardizing our future and our children's future. I just pray to God that all things will lead in the direction that God, the Heavenly Father, wants them to lead into. That His will will be done. Because I've never seen so much anxiety, so much hatefulness, so much bitterness, so much worrisome moments that we're all living in right now towards it. I hate to say it, looking like our Kelly's heel. And other nations and countries of their Achilles heel. These are not good moments. Please, let's listen. My time's expired. I yield back. Mr. Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for testifying uh, tonight. I'm delighted to follow Mr. Ratcliffe because he just perfectly summarized the defense that, that, that my Republican colleagues are mounting of this behavior. And the defense goes like this. The president is acting on some deep historical concern, apparently invisible concern, about corruption. And that because he's so concerned about corruption in Ukraine, he's holding up aid and being prudent and judicious. The first part of that is pretty easy to dispose of because President Trump wasn't worried about corruption in Ukraine. In fact, in the two conversations he had with the president of Ukraine on April 21st and July 25th, not once does the president of the United States use the word or mention corruption to the president? The second part of that is a little bit more interesting, that he's just being prudent and holding up aid. That's not just wrong, it's illegal. Because, Ms. Cooper, and I, I want you to help us walk through this. It's dangerous. Since the Impoundment Control Act of 1974, the president has not had the authority to, on a whim or out of prudence, or as my Republicans say, because of a general skepticism of foreign aid, to stop foreign aid. Ms. Cooper, under our Constitution, it's the Congress, not the President, that controls the power of the purse, correct? correct. Yes, sir. And the security assistance that was, the assistance that was authorized to Ukraine was authorized and appropriated by the Congress, correct? Yes, sir. So Congress is also concerned about corruption. It wants to ensure that American foreign assistance is spent wisely and does not worse in corruption. And so when Congress authorized this money, it built in conditions, just as Mr. Ratcliffe suggested. By law, Ukraine wouldn't get all the money until it demonstrated that it had undertaken substantial anti-corruption reforms. Ms. Cooper, under the law, the Department of Defense works with the State Department and other agencies to establish anti-corruption benchmarks and determine whether Ukraine has sufficiently met those benchmarks, correct? That's correct. That provision pertains to the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. And that's not, that's a legally specified process. That's not the president in the Oval Office manifesting a general skepticism of foreign aid, right? That's sir, a process. It is, it, is a, it is a congressionally mandated process, yes, sir. So did that process take place for the DOD funding that was held, held up in July? Nope. Sir, the process that took place for the certification took place prior to the May uh, certification to the U.S. Congress. So, right. Not only did it take place before, as required by law, but months before President Trump froze the money, the Department of Defense, in consultation with state, 
send a letter to Congress certifying, and you, you, you said this in your opening statement, the government of Ukraine has taken substantial actions to make defense institutional reforms for the purposes of decreasing corruption, increasing accountability, and sustaining improvements of combat capability enabled by U.S. assistance. So by the time President Trump froze the aid, the Department of Defense had spent weeks, if not months, determining that the Ukrainian government met every requirement in the law and made significant strides in combating corruption. Is that correct? That is correct. We made that determination in May. So this wasn't about corruption. The timeline proves it. And in fact, if there was any doubt about what was going on here, the chairman referred to your inference from the conversation with uh, Ambassador Volker that if the Ukraine made a statement committing to the investigations, the aid would be lifted. You covered that with the chairman. And then, of course, we have the press conference of October 17th when Mick Mulvaney let the cat fully out of the bag. He revealed that President Trump talked to him about, and I quote Mick Mulvaney here, the corruption related to the DNC server and admitted that, quote, that's why we held up the money. Any other explanation for the hold is a farce. Now, in my remaining 30 seconds, just so that people understand what I referred to, in the 1970s, Richard Nixon just arbitrarily decided, I don't know it was because he had a general skepticism of foreign aid or what his motives were, but Richard Nixon decided to hold up congressionally mandated aid. And as a result, Congress went to work and passed the Impoundment Control Act of 1974 which prohibits the president from withholding congressionally appropriated funds without the approval of Congress for any reason. Is that correct, Ms. Cooper? Sir, I am not a lawyer, but that approximates my understanding of the provision of the impoundment control. Okay, I'll go with that approximates. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Conaway. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As Paul Harvey said, this is the rest of the story, and my colleague failed to put the right emphasis on certain issues with respect to the certification. DOD certification was not your corruption writ large throughout the entire country of Ukraine. It was narrowly focused on defense institutional reforms and combat capability. Isn't that correct, Ms. Cooper? That's correct, sir. Uh, first off, Ms. Cooper, thank you for being here this afternoon. I, I appreciate that. But my colleague seemed to leave that out as original. He read it when you we read your statement, but he left off the corrective uh, emphasis. So the certification in May didn't really speak to the broader concept of corruption throughout the rest of Ukraine that the president would be familiar with, or the rest of us would be familiar with. Sir, the May certification was specific to the defense sector, Thank you. defense industry, and it did reference the importance of civilian control of the military, relates, which relates more broadly to... Right, but I think, I think all of us would argue, or none of us, I think, would argue that that fixes your corruption throughout the rest of the country. Um, Ms. Cooper, maybe you can shed some light on the specific details. We talk about this you, the security assistance <clears throat> program, $250 million. Um, Some would argue that because of the pause, uh, that people died in August because of the pause. Can you help us understand exactly what obligated and was there things that were about to be delivered to Ukraine? Was Ukraine out of ammunition? Were they out of, uh, out of javelins? Were they out of all this stuff? And that because of this pause, they didn't get a certain... Uh, lethal equipment that uh, they needed in order to protect their folks during the month of August? Sir, we will deliver all of the equipment. I understand. I was trying to get a timeline. And it, 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 there was no shortfall in equipment deliveries um, that were expected within that time frame. Obligate means that you're putting the funding on contract. Okay, and that's uh, contracts. And starting the process. Yeah, those full contracts will be full, fulfilled. Uh, fourth quarter, perhaps, or whatever so, it was? Sir, I have to say I'm a policy official. I am not a contracting expert. Um, but my understanding is that we will be able to make up for lost time sure. in the contracting process. Fantastic. You go through three or four steps as you went to because you disagreed with the hole being placed on the, uh, on the, on the uh, assistance. And uh, I certainly agree with that. But uh, did you get any kind of criticism from the folks that you deal with because you were going against the OMB's direction to put a hold on that? Did you get criticized at all for that? Absolutely not. My uh, entire chain of command was supportive of advocating for uh, removing the hold on the funds. And you weren't restricted on full-throated advocating on behalf of getting this uh, hold lifted, were you? 
No, sir. I face no restrictions. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. I uh, thought you might be more in, uh, in touch with the actual specifics of the accounting process, and so I will uh, I'll defer any further questions. And again, thanks for being here tonight. I yield back. Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Hale, I, when did you actually find out about the hold on the Ukraine assistant? Was it July 21st? Yes, I, um, in the deposition that I did, the closed hearing, I misspoke. I was confused, and I confused June 21st, which was one, when State first sent the CN up to the Congressional Notification to OMB for clearance. It was only after about July 18, and I think the 21st is when I heard um, that there was a, a potential hold. Thank you for that clarification. Now, did you attend uh, the July 26 deputies meeting, uh, deputies committee meeting that occurred? Yes, I did. Was it also your understanding that the president directed the whole? Uh, we were told in that meeting by the OMB representative that they were objecting to proceeding with the assistance because the president had so directed uh, through the chief of staff, acting chief of staff. What was the State Department's position regarding the whole? State Department advocated, as I did in that meeting, for proceeding with all of the assistance uh, consistent with our policies and interests in Ukraine. You believed uh, what you said? You believed in the release of the hold? Yes, I did. Did anyone at the interagency meeting at the end of July support the hold? Did anybody want the hold to remain? And if so, who? What agency? The only agency, the only agency represented in the meeting that uh, indicated that they supported the hold was OMB. Ms. Cooper, did you understand um, similarly that there was an overwhelming interagency cons uh, consensus to lift the hold uh, and that OMB at the direction of the president was the only roadblock? Yes, ma'am. How is the security assistance in the national security interests of the United States? What is our interest? Explain that to my constituents in Alabama who are wondering why we should care about the uh, security the hold that's on the security assistance. Yes, ma'am. This specific assistance helps build the capacity of the Ukrainian armed forces. And it's important to understand that these are forces that are fighting to defend themselves against Russian aggression every day. It's an ongoing war. So they do need this equipment uh, to support their ability to defend themselves. And I would say there's a larger issue here that relates to U.S. policy on Russia. We believe it's very important to strengthen the capacity of Ukraine in order to deter Russian aggression elsewhere around the world. Exactly. Were you ever able to get a reason why that hold was on? Did you ever get a reason? No, ma'am. The only thing that I heard about it, but this is, again, you know, second, third hand, I'm, was that the president was concerned about corruption. But that was all I ever heard. So would you, um, were you ever provided any additional information about the reason for the whole? No, ma'am. I thank you, and I yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Thank the uh, gentlewoman. Uh, my colleagues in the minority asked uh, Mr. Hale, isn't it common to have holds on military aid? And I think you said they're not unusual. Would you agree, though, that it would be very unusual to place a hold on military aid in order to leverage a foreign country to get them to investigate a political opponent? Yes. And I take it you would agree that that would be completely inappropriate? That would be inconsistent with the conduct of our foreign policy in general. And it would also be wrong, wouldn't it? Certainly not what I would do. Um, Mr. Turner. Of course, it would be interesting if any witness had ever testified that that was the case. I yield my time to Mr. Jordan. Thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. First of all, I just wanted to go where the chairman started. He said that... Ambassador Hale was one of our witnesses. They're all your witnesses. You, you, you called 17 witnesses. You subpoenaed 15 of them. Uh, they're all your witnesses. We didn't get a subpoena anyone. We didn't get to call anyone. You gave us an opportunity to get a list to you a couple weeks ago where we made suggestions on who you might allow us to have. So we did put three people of those 17 on that list. 
so that they could provide at least some semblance of, of context and framework for this entire thing. So once again, trying misleading the the folks watching this hearing is is um, not not helpful. Thank you both for being here and for your service to our country, uh, Ambassador. I read through yours, uh, Ambassador to Pakistan, Lebanon, Special Envoy of the Middle East, Ambassador to Jordan, served in Tunisia, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. You've been to about every hot spot on the planet. Thank you for uh, those hardship assignments. We we uh, we appreciate your uh, your service. Let me go uh, first to uh, earlier this today, Mr. Sondland, Ambassador Sondland, excuse me, uh, said that he was denied access to some of his records. And the State Department put out a statement. They said this, Ambassador Sondland, like every current Department of State employee, called before Congress in this matter, retained at all times, and continues to retain full access to his State Department documentary records and his State Department email account, which he has always been fully free to access and review at will. That's an accurate statement from the State Department, isn't it, Ambassador Hale? I had not seen it until shortly before entering this uh, hearing room, but it sounds accurate, yes. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Ambassador, you're aware of no connection between the pause and aid in exchange for any kind of investigation. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I missed the keyword. Could you repeat the question? You're, you're, you're not aware of any connection between the pause and aid and an exchange for some kind of investigation being announced or done by Ukraine. Is that correct. right? And you're not aware of Secretary Pompeo having any knowledge, direct knowledge of a connection between investigations and security aid. Is that I'm correct? Not, I'm not aware of that. I'm, he did not speak to me about that. You're not aware of any nefarious motive to withhold aid to Ukraine. Is that correct? Correct, sir. In fact, you testified that what you knew was that President Trump was, one, skeptical of foreign assistance generally, Mr. Ratcliffe highlighted that in his round of questioning, and two, skeptical of the corruption environment in Ukraine. Is that accurate? Well, we had heard that. That was a general impression at the State Department, correct? And the aid was actually eventually released to Ukraine. Is that correct as well? Uh, yes, I read that, sir. And there was just a 55-day or less than two months pause in the actual hold on the aid. Is that right, uh, Ambassador? Seems so, yes, correct. And to your knowledge, as a top principal at the State Department, an investigation into the Biden's charisma of the 2016 election never happened by the Ukrainians. Is that correct? I don't know that I have the ability to answer that question, having taken this job in August of 2018. Oh, well, since you've taken the job, how about that? To my knowledge, that's correct. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cooper, Ukraine is the first line of defense against Russia's aggression and expansion into Europe. Numerous witnesses testify that Ukraine is, in fact, vulnerable to Russian influence and control. At your deposition, sir, you testified that providing security assistance is, quote, vital to helping the Ukrainians be able to defend themselves, end quote. What did you mean by that, sir? that uh, we have a long-standing policy of uh, helping Ukraine become a resilient state in order to be able to defend itself. We want a reliable and resilient and self-reliant security and economic partner in Ukraine that can stand up to Russian intimidation and aggression. You testified at the time of Russia's 2014 attack that the Ukrainian armed forces were, quote, significantly less capable than it is today, end quote. Would you say, sir, that Ukrainian forces were outmatched by Russia's military in important ways? I, I did not so testify. I think uh, I, I'm Ambassador Hale, and of course, Ms. Cooper may wish Madam to Cooper, respond. would you like to comment? I'm sorry, I do believe that was my deposition, but could you just repeat the question briefly? So uh, during the time of Russia's 2014 attack, the Ukrainian armed forces were quote, significantly less capable than it is today. Uh, would you say that the Ukrainian forces were outmatched by Russia's military in critical ways? Absolutely. Uh, are the Ukrainian forces now completely self-sufficient in your mind, it, essentially in their ability to deter Russian aggression? No, sir, they, they have a long way to go. Uh, would you say that the Ukrainian armed forces now com are now completely self-sufficient, or how, how much of an impact do, does the U.S. need to have 
in terms of that deterrence and how critical is the relationship between both Ukraine and the U.S.? Sir, the Ukrainians are on the right path to be able to uh, provide for their own security, but they will still need U.S. and allied support uh, for quite some time. And they need that support in the form of you know, tangible uh, assistance um, as well as uh, political and diplomatic support. So this question is to the both of you. Uh, why was Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea so significant in your mind? Madam Cooper. Russia violated the sovereignty of Ukraine's territory. Russia illegally annexed territory that belonged to Ukraine. They also um, denied Ukraine access to its naval fleet at the time. And to this day, Russia is building uh, a capability on Crimea designed to expand Russian military uh, power projection far beyond the immediate region. In 2014, uh, were there concerns in Washington, here in Washington and European capitals that Russia might not stop in Ukraine? I was not in my current position in 2014, but it is my understanding that there was significant fear about uh, where Russian aggression would stop. So what, what, what about today? If, if, if the U.S. were to withdraw its military support of Ukraine, what would effectively happen? Probably wind up it in Alaska. It is my belief that if we were to withdraw our support, it would embolden Russia. It would also validate Russia's violation of international law. And which country stands to benefit the most, would stand to benefit the most from such a withdrawal? Russia. Ambassador Taylor uh, testified about the importance of the U.S. upholding uh, the international system. And uh, it has underwritten peace in Europe since the end of World War II. A critical aspect of defending that system is ensuring that Russia cannot change its borders by military force. That is why there is strong bipartisan support for providing Ukraine with security assistance. That is why it is so incredibly destructive of the President of the United States to withhold this assistance as part of a scheme to pressure Ukraine into investigating a debunked conspiracy theory and attack former Vice President Biden. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. Uh, as Army Reserve Surgeon, I can say, as both of you have, that I serve proudly for two Republicans and two Democrat uh, presidents myself. Um, I want to go to, um, pardon Ms. Cooper, if I can, page three. So I heard the president had directed the Office of Management and Budget to hold funds because of his concerns about corruption in, in Ukraine. And, you know, you're coming from the DOD side here. You know, I served a year in Iraq. And it was important, and I think it's something that the Army always does, as I have seen, that we don't want to deliver aid or assistance if, there, if it's going to some corrupt, or being delivered in some corrupt way. In other words, if we're going to build a medical treatment facility for the Iraqis, uh, we want to make sure we're not uh, getting charged ten times as much. I mean, we, 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 we're concerned about corruption in general when we're delivering funds uh, through the DOD. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So I think that, that that's a normal thing to, to want to be concerned about. And we would do that in, in Iraq, and uh, especially if, if we're providing payment for something. So I just want to go through a few things with you, because multiple witnesses have testified that the action to provide javelins to Ukraine by the Trump administration dem demonstrated strong U.S. support to Ukraine. Ambassador Yovanovitch, in her deposition, said President Trump's decision to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine, that our policy actually got stronger over the last three years. She also said in terms of lethal assistance, we all felt it was very significant with this that this administration made the decision to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine. Ambassador Taylor said it was a substantial improvement in that this administration provided javelin anti-tank weapons very strong political message that said the Americans are willing to provide more than blankets. 
Ambassador Volker testified that providing lethal defensive arms to Ukraine has been extremely helpful. Mr. Volker also stated, MREs and blankets and all, that's fine, but if you're being attacked with mortars and artilleries and tanks, you need to be able to fight back. Secretary George Kent stated that javelins are incredibly effective weapons at stopping armed advance, and the Russians are scared of them. Special Advisor Catherine Croft stated, the javelins help Ukraine defend themselves. A decision to provide javelins, we believe, is counter to Russian interest. Do, do you dispute what these witnesses have testified to, in, including Ambassador Ivanovich, Taylor, Volker, and others? Sir, I absolutely agree that the Javelin system uh, is an important capability and that this was a very important decision to support Ukraine with this capability. Thank you. And you already testified that you're personally proud of the uh, Trump administration's decision to arm Ukraine with Javelins, correct? That is correct, sir. So one of the things on page three tonight, you, you were talking about a meeting July 26th, and after that you said... Um, I was aware the national security community expressed unanimous support for resuming the funding as in the U.S. national security interest. That's correct? You said that tonight. That's correct, sir. So I guess I take a little question with resuming because we don't want to resume as is. Would that be correct? Because as is would not include javelin. Sir, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following. Well, what I was going to say, the previous administration, javelins were not provided, even though they could have been. President Obama stopped the javelins. He could have delivered javelins. Let's put it that way. Sir, I, I think I should clarify what I meant by that statement. Resuming was just referring to the fact that OMB had placed a hold on the assistance so we weren't spending. Okay. And I wanted to resume the spending. Okay, well. So that we could maintain this policy, okay. maintain the strength. Maintain the policy, but I guess what I'm asking, there is a difference, and I, th I think under Secretary Hale, you might, I thought I saw you nodding, um, the difference being that as it's resumed in this case, now it included javelins, which the Obama administration denied. Is that correct? It is true that um, the Trump administration uh, approved the release of uh, defensive lethal assistance to include Javelin, whereas the previous administration did not support that policy. Mr. Hale, do you have a comment on that? That seems correct. I defer to, to Ms. Cooper as the expert. Okay. Well, I think we can conclude that uh, more than blankets and MREs has been helping the Ukrainians. and. Uh, the lethal defensive weapons are something the Trump administration has approved, and it's a benefit to all of us. Thank you. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here this evening. You know, there is this mystery surrounding the hold on the aid in, in July, it appears. But back in May, Ms. Cooper, I, I believe you said that there was aid that was conditioned but you certified in May that the conditions had been met. And they include, included progress on command and control reform, commitment to pursue defense industry reform, and pass laws to enable government to government procurement. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. So then when you find out in July that they're concerned about corruption, you're scratching your head, right? So yes, ma'am, we did not understand. And do you know of any effort that was undertaken then to assess the corruption in Ukraine in June, July, August? Ma'am, as I believe I said in my deposition, the only um, specific uh, discussions that I am aware of related to that series of interagency meetings, the sub-PCC as we called it, the PCC, uh, policy coordination committee and the uh, deputy small group and in those meetings participants did discuss the degree to which um, corruption was a concern and the degree to which there was progress and my recollection of what the participants said in these meetings was that there was a very positive sense that um, progress was being made. So you have, have these meetings, progress is being made, 
nothing really changes from May until September that would then trigger the release of the money except a whistleblower came forward. Ma'am, I do not know what triggered the release of the funding. All right. The fact that there was reference made to money being withheld for other countries was made by some of our colleagues. But in those situations in countries like Pakistan, Lebanon, they're multi-year funding streams, correct? Ma'am, those accounts fall outside of my purview, so I cannot answer that question. Okay. Well, I've been told that that is indeed the case. So that there's not the immediate angst or hit financially that would potentially accrue. But the difference, as I see it, in Ukraine as compared to these other countries is that Ukraine is engaged in a hot war with Russia right now. And it seems that withholding that money was irresponsible, considering that they had made all of this, taken steps to meet all the conditions that we had requested of them, and Congress had appropriated the funds. Is that not the case? Ma'am, I and my DOD colleagues advocated strenuously for the release of these funds because of their national security importance. So basically, the entire interests of the Department of Defense and State Department were consistently supportive of releasing these funds. Everyone was mystified as to why the funds had been withheld, and everyone's running around trying to get an answer, and you're getting kind of obtuse responses saying it was the president because of corruption. Now, what we see is that President Zelensky gets elected in April. The expectation is that Vice President Pence is going to attend the inauguration in September, and then the president pulls the carpet out from under him in terms of him going. And then he proceeds in June or July to withhold the funds. There is a concerted effort by the President of the United States to act in a manner that is not consistent with our interest in wanting to protect Ukraine and help them deal with the Russian aggression at its border. Would you agree with that? Ma'am, I have advocated for the security assistance, and I have advocated for high-level engagement with the government of Ukraine because I think both are in the national security interest. I yield back. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Chairman. Under Secretary, Assistant Secretary, thank you both for being here. You're both recognized as experts, dedicated public servants, and I've got to tell you, being the President of the United States is perhaps the most complicated endeavor in the history of the world. No one could do it without people like you to provide that backbone that you do, and thank you for doing that. I don't mean to repeat the same questions ad nauseum, but I think we reached a point of nauseam, I don't know, sometime yesterday or some time ago. It's some repetitive here, and you'll forgive me for doing that. Although, Ms. Cooper, I do have some questions based on some things you've said previously, and I just want to add for clarification. There's a question about these e-mails that I think they claimed withholding, described withholding the aid, and they had come from Capitol Hill or from someone on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Is that true? Sir, are you referring to my statement today or something previous? I believe this was previous, a question we had previous. Are you aware of such an e-mail? I'm sorry, I don't think I have enough information to make an assessment. Is it from a particular page in my deposition? No, it's just reporting that we've heard that there may have been communications with you with someone on the Foreign Affairs Committee on the Hill. Is that not true? That there may have been communications with me? Yes, e-mail with you. Sir, I'm not aware. Okay, thank you. And for clarification as well, someone may have asked you or queried you from the Ukrainian embassy about the withholding of aid. Is that true? Did you hear from them? Sir, I testified earlier that the communication from the Ukrainian embassy was to my staff, and my staff mentioned this to me after my deposition. 
Um, the only specific communication that I recollect with the Ukrainians about this specific issue was on, I believe it was September 5th, at a reception at the Ukrainian embassy. And just to bore down on that just a little bit, was that just a query generally about the forthcoming aid or was it specific regarding them being aware that the aid was being withheld? So just to be clear, the September 5th conversation that I had was specific to uh, the hold. There, they, there was an awareness of okay. that and there was a question of concern. Okay. Thank you. You know, Ms. Cooper, uh, well, to both of you, uh, Under Secretary Hill as well, uh, at the end of the day, it really does, and I've done this before, it really does come down to this. Uh, the transcript I'm holding up is a transcript of the phone call between President Zelensky and President Trump that uh, I would hope every American would take the opportunity to read. It's only a few pages long. And, uh, and much more information beyond that is maybe helpful to inform, but it really comes down to those conversations, those few sentences. But um, Mr. Hill, well, going quickly through a series of questions, and I have your answers here, so this won't take long, uh, and you've answered them generally anyway. You agree the United States should evaluate whether a country is worthy of our aid. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. And you understand as well that President Trump has been skeptical generally of foreign aid and, and some of the money that we've given. Is that fair as well? I think so. And I think that's been fairly consistent. He's done that since before he was elected, I think. Um, others in the process have testified that Ukraine has a long history of corruption. That's not going to surprise any one of us. We've talked about that about a thousand times. Do you think it was right that President Trump would test, is a word I think he used previously, that he would test President Zelensky prior to, uh, to providing some of the security assistance? The President Zelensky was new. Um, yes. I had met him in February. I was impressed by him. But I think it was understandable for the administration as a new president in Ukraine was coming to office to understand better what that president's policies would be and attitude toward the United States. And see, Under Secretary, I think that's key because we've had it referred to while the DOD had completed their review about the same time. But this was a person who was elected and we knew nothing about him. He didn't have a history of governance in Ukraine. He came really a, a little bit like President Trump himself. He did not come from a, a public background that we would have much information on him. And it seems prudent, as you said, to kind of test him and see if he was serious about Ukraine. And at some point, I'm going to conclude, I believe it was about Labor Day, the Secretary was able to engage a president on the security assistance, about the same time, by the way, that uh, you had some others, uh, Secretary Vice President Pence and Bolton's and, and Bolton as well, as well as a burden sharing review was completed and shortly thereafter the aid was released. Is that your understanding? Um, I, I was never informed as to why the assistance was released. I did read about it. Okay, well those events did happen and it seemed like they were the reason the aid was released, but thank you both and I yield back. Mr. Quigley. Thank you. Thank you both for being here and thank you for your service. You've both been asked about uh, the importance of this uh, military assistance as it affects Ukrainian sovereignty and uh, its importance because of potential uh, greater ambitions by uh, the Russians. Let me try to put it in context and please get your reaction from, from both of you, from a, someone who had been there before, uh, a renowned international policy expert on such things, uh, Zygmuntov Brzezinski. Uh, his quote seems to strike home today. He wrote, Russia can either be an empire or a democracy, but it cannot be both. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire, but with Ukraine suborned and then subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. Your thoughts of how this puts this into context today, please? Sir, I think that is a very powerful and accurate quote. I would agree. <clears throat> Ms. Cooper, you uh, talked about emails that were drawn to your attention, um, that you were, they were sent to your staff, is that correct? The emails that I discussed this evening were emails sent to my staff, that is correct. Okay. Uh, I, I think, first of all, it's important to point this out, that it's not something you were aware of. It points to a larger issue that the Defense Department and the State Department have refused to comply with a, a duly issued subpoena 
to provide this committee with documents that would further shed light on when precisely Ukrainians knew about the hold. So this isn't something you're aware of, but there is untold information out there being blocked that would draw greater light and help us understand. Is there anything else out there that you're aware of or possibilities that are out there with DOD or the State Department which could help us shed light on what the Ukrainians knew and when they knew it? Sir, I have shared with the committee all that I recollect, but I have not done an exhaustive investigation. So I really can't speculate on what else might be uh, available by combing through all of the Defense Department records, which are substantial. Did the State Department or the Department of Defense ask you for your information, or did, you, or did they coordinate with you to get information you had? Sir, uh, I was um, told not to, not to destroy anything, and our, um, our, our IT personnel uh, have been collecting documents, is my understanding. So um, that, that occurs without, um, without the individual having to... But they were collecting it and passing it on to state or DOD, is that correct? I'm sorry, sir, could you they were, that? You said your department was collecting it. Well, they weren't passing that on to you. They were passing it on to to the State Department Sir, or the Department I, of Defense. This is what they reported to me. I have not seen the documents that have been collected. I only know those documents um, that I have produced or that my staff has brought to my attention or that I have received. So, no, I do not know what has happened with the documents uh, that have been collected. Same general question to you, sir. Now, I requested and, and was granted access to documents that I either originated or that had been sent to me that were relevant to the pertinent matters of this investigation during a finite time period. <coughs> um, I don't have really information about what else is going on in terms of other documents that, that I did not produce or that uh, I did not receive. Well, I do know I, there was a, a move to gather them, and I understood generally, indirectly, and informally that they have been gathered. That's the extent of my knowledge. It's not my area of responsibility. Yes, but did they pass them on to you, or did they pass them on to the, the administration and somehow? The only documents I received, sir, were those within the parameters I described. What I requested, which was those and given, were the documents that either I produced or that were sent to me relevant to the matters we're discussing today. Thank you. I yield back to the chairman. Ms. Stefanik. Thank you to both of our witnesses for your service today. Um, Ms. Cooper, I wanted to start with you. You spoke eloquently of the threat of Russia when it illegally annexed Crimea, how that's a threat not only to Ukraine, but it's also a threat to Europe and the United States, a national security challenge. And I sit on the House Armed Services Committee. We know that the most important support for Ukraine in terms of lethal defensive aid is in the forms of javelins. Would you agree with that? Yes, ma'am. And which administration were those javelins made available to Ukraine? This administration, the Trump administration. And not the Obama administration. That is correct. Um, both of you, have you ever spoken with the president about Ukraine aid? No, I have not. No, ma'am. Um, Under Secretary Hale, you testified that you had no direct knowledge of any nefarious motivations to withhold aid to Ukraine, correct? Correct. And to your knowledge, you testified that there were no strings attached to the aid, correct? That's page 184 of your deposition. Yeah, no such knowledge. And more specifically, you testified that you had no knowledge of Ukraine aid being held up for investigations. Is that correct? Correct. During the temporary hold of security assistance, this was until Ambassador Taylor sent you the cable, you had never even heard the words Burisma or Biden, correct? Well, in the context of what we're discussing, uh, correct. Great. You testified that on page 96. And ultimately, as we know, the aid was released to Ukraine, correct? Yes, I read that. Now, let's talk about the context broadly of this hold. You testified that it's not just Ukraine, that there were, in fact, other countries whose security assistance was on hold. Quote, the aid package to Lebanon was also being held in the same fashion, correct? Correct. 
and foreign aid was held from northern triangle countries of South America, correct? Uh, of Central America, correct. Central America. And you also testified that when you served as ambassador to Pakistan, security assistance was also held uh, for their failure to conform to our concerns regarding terrorists and other issues on the Afghan-Pakistan border. Correct. You know, basically, let's broadly talk about the context of all of these holds on aid. When we talk about aid, I always think about these are hard-earned taxpayer dollars. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And isn't it correct that this administration, the Trump administration, has been conducting a foreign assistance review to reestablish norms that guide the assistance uh, as we provide aid overseas? That's correct. You testified that this review had been going on for quite a while, and the administration did not want to take a business-as-usual approach to foreign assistance, a feeling that once a country has received a certain assistance package, it's something that continues forever. And you continued, the program had to be evaluated that they were actually worthy beneficiaries of our assistance, that our program made sense, that we avoid nation-building strategies, and that we provide assistance to countries that are that are lost in terms of our policy to our adversaries. Is that correct? That's correct. And you testify that you warmly welcome this assistance review. Correct. Um, and again, just, just to get this on record and for the millions of Americans viewing, security assistance was in fact released to Ukraine. I know I've already asked this, but this is a really important point. Correct. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Swallow. Ms. Cooper, your testimony today destroys two of the pillars of the president's defense and one justification for his conduct. First pillar, no harm, no foul. The Ukrainians didn't know that the hold was in place, so didn't really hurt them. Second pillar, this president was a real champion of anti-corruption. He cared about corruption in Ukraine. So I want to go through your new testimony today. It's your testimony now that after an employee came forward to you, you believe you have some evidence that the Ukrainians first inquired about security assistance to someone in your office on July 25 of this year. Is that right? That's correct. And July 25 is also the day that President Trump officially talked to President Zelensky where investigations of the Bidens were brought up. Is that right? Sir, I only know what has been reported uh, publicly on this. And that was reported, is that right? That's correct. Second, this president, as a champion of anti-corruption, your testimony today is that on May 23, you certified that as far as it related to your duties, Ukraine had met the corruption concerns for the aid to be released. Is that right? Sir, the Defense Department certified. And after that date, Inexplicably, the President of the United States puts a hold on security assistance. Is that right? That was what I heard in July, yes. Now, this anti-corruption president who cares so much about rooting out corruption in Ukraine, did he ever call you after he put the hold to say, Ms. Cooper, what's going on in Ukraine? No, sir. Ambassador Hale, did he ever call you to ask about an update on Ukraine corruption? No, sir. To your knowledge, did he ever call your boss, Secretary Pompeo? I don't know. Ms. Cooper, did he ever call the many bosses that you've had at the Department of Defense? The secretaries know, or acting secretaries? I, I don't know, sir. Now as to the justification. The justification is that the Obama administration only provided blankets so the Ukrainians should be grateful, even after being shaken down that the Trump administration provided more. But the truth, Ms. Cooper, is that under the Obama administration and the European Reassurance Initiative, $175 million were provided from U.S. taxpayer dollars to the Ukrainians. Is that right? Sir, I don't have that figure. The figure that we typically use is to say we've provided $1.6 billion to date. And, and I, we've, you know, but I don't have the breakdown in front of me. And the Obama administration also trained five military battalions of the Ukrainians. Is that correct? Again, I don't have the figures in front of me, but yes, the training program began in the Obama administration and, and we did train many forces. And under the Obama administration founded Ukrainian security assistance initiative provided to the Ukrainians were armored Humvees, 
tactical drones, night vision devices, armored vests, and medical equipment. Is that correct? Does all sound like uh, pieces of equipment that were provided uh, in the Obama administration, to my recollection? You'd agree that's a lot more than blankets, right? Yes, sir. Ambassador Hale, the aid that was withheld to Lebanon and Pakistan, those were for legitimate foreign policy objectives. Is that right? I would say that's true, the assistance to Pakistan. I've not heard an explanation for the uh, current hold on the Lebanese program. And you would agree that withholding aid to investigate a political opponent is not a legitimate foreign policy objective. Is that right? Correct. So I guess we can agree that even Bernie Madoff made charitable contributions, but it doesn't make him a good guy. Ms. Cooper, your testimony today demonstrates the power of coming forward and defying lawless orders from the president. Because you came forward and testified, we learned this new information, which destroys the central defense that the Republicans have put forward. Because Ambassador Taylor came forward, one of his employees learned this defense from the Republicans that all we had was hearsay evidence. And Mr. Holmes said, actually, I heard the President of the United States tell Ambassador Sondland, where are we with the investigations? Your courage has aided this investigation despite the President's continued obstruction. And I yield back. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ambassador Hale, <clears throat> you're in essence the number three guy at the State Department, is that correct? Correct. You represent roughly 70,000 folks. I, or you, you, I would say I represent them. I'm part of them. Part I'm of one them. of them. Yes. Um, well, you, where you are part of a pretty fantastic workforce that I've been proud to be able to serve a, alongside. We we share a time together in in, in Pakistan, um, and so thank them. I know they oftentimes don't get the um, pats on the back or the accolades for what they do for our national security, um, but there's some of us that do recognize that and and appreciate that. Um, did anybody raise issues to you, Ambassador Hale, about investigations to Biden's or Burisma? No, sir. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cooper, you have a great staff. I don't think my staff would have read my 115-page um, deposition and gave me feedback, so uh, give, them, give them gold stars. Um, you said in your, in your deposition, and you just confirmed with my colleague from, from California that she certified on 23 May that the Ukraine aid for the, the review of the depart their, their defense um, in industry and Department of Defense you know, was passed the corruption test. Is that correct? Sir, I think the wording was more along the lines of uh, progress has been made or sufficient progress has been made. Um, it didn't. It didn't reference any kind of an anti-corruption test per se. Um, did this change, or was there a reevaluation with a new president coming in? Because President Zelensky was inaugurated in office two days before that date. Did that have an impact on how he was going to continue some of those some of those pieces? Was that taken into account in this review? Not prior to May twenty third. No, sir. So the review was basically done on the previous, the efforts done by the previous Poroshenko administration. Yes, sir, although it's important to note that the review related most specifically to the Ministry of Defense. Sure, sure, but there were ultimately changes under the, under the Zelensky regime, is that correct? Yes, sir, there's a new Minister of Defense. Um, can you explain, I know FMF, Foreign Military Financing and State Departments, but can you explain the difference between FMF and USAI funding and, uh, and also how the Ukrainians get um, um, lethal aid? I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of that? Also, how the Ukrainians... Actually get lethal aid, because is lethal aid covered under one of these two buckets? So, um, there are three separate pieces to our overall ability to provide equipment to the Ukrainian armed forces. The first is the foreign military finance system, which is um, a, a State Department authority, and countries around the world have this authority. 
that authority is used for some of the training and equipment. There's also the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. That's a DOD authority. Unlike the state authority, the DOD authority is only a one-year authority. And then third, there's the opportunity for defense sales. And that is something that we're working with the Ukrainians on now so that they can actually purchase U.S. equipment. But the Javelin specifically was provided under FMF initially, and now the Ukrainians are interested in the purchase of Javelin. And there wasn't a hold put on purchasing of equipment. Is that correct? Not to my understanding, no. Can I ask you a non-impeachment inquiry question, Ms. Cooper? A non-what? A non-impeachment inquiry question. Sir, my time is yours. What can we be doing to help the Ukrainians defend against Russian electronic warfare? What more can we be doing to help the Ukrainians defend against electronic warfare by the Russians? Good question. Well, what I can say in an open hearing is that there actually is some electronic warfare detection equipment that is included in the USAI package. So there's a piece of capability that we're already working to provide them. I think this specific topic, though, is more suitable for a closed-door session. That's a good copy. Thanks for both of y'all's service to our country. And, Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony today. I want us to make an important distinction here because a few of my colleagues have rattled off countries where we've actually held up aid. There is a big distinction between holding up aid for a legitimate policy reason, foreign policy reason, and holding up aid because it's part of a shakedown, because it's in the service of a president who asked for a political favor of a country to go investigate a political rival. I think that's important for us to note. But I want to ask you, Ms. Cooper, you said that the money was cleared to go by the DOD on May 23rd. Is that right? That's correct. And it didn't get released until September 11th? Yes, I should just clarify. The second half of the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative was notified to Congress on, I believe it was May 23rd, and then there was a waiting period for congressional approval. And then after that point, so in kind of mid-June, roughly, it was available for— So perhaps 90 days or so, 95 days, something like that. Yes, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but that sounds right. Well, you both testified that the hold on security assistance was not in the national security interest of the United States and that the hold might embolden Russia. We've heard the same from numerous other witnesses that have come before us. But this was not the only issue with the hold, right? We understand that people within the United States government had significant concerns about the legality of the hold as it relates to the Impoundment Control Act. This is because the money had been authorized by Congress and signed into law by President Trump. Ms. Cooper, at the July meetings, were there any discussions about whether the hold could be implemented in a legal fashion? So in the July 26th meeting, my leadership raised the question of how the president's guidance could be implemented and proffered that perhaps a reprogramming action would be the way to do this, but that more research would need to be done. So then after that discussion, we had a lower-level discussion at my level on the 31st of July. And let me ask you about that July 31st meeting. Based on your conversations with colleagues at the DOD at the July 31st interagency meeting, did you share your understanding of the legal mechanisms that were available at that time? Yes, sir. And what were they? I expressed that it was my understanding that there were two ways that we would be able to implement presidential guidance to stop obligating the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. And the first option would be for the president to do a rescission. The second is a reprogramming action that the Department of Defense would do. And both of those would require congressional notice. Yes, sir. There would be an extra step that the president would have to take to notify Congress. As far as you know, was there ever any notice that was sent out to Congress? Sir, I did express that I believed it would require a notice to Congress and that then there was no such 
notice to my knowledge or preparation of such a notice to my knowledge. And as far as you know, there was never any official rescission or reprogramming of that money? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Instead, what happened was OMB devised an alternative solution involving creative footnotes to implement the hold. And there came a time in August when the Department of Defense no longer supported these unusual footnotes because of concerns that there might not be sufficient time for DOD to obligate the funds before the end of the fiscal year in violation of the Impoundment Control Act. So despite DOD's concerns in mid-August about the Impoundment Control Act and OMB's footnotes, the hold nevertheless continued through September 11th, even after, now as an aside, this is even after the whistleblower had come forward. Is that right? It is correct that the hold was released on September 11th, yes. Well, I know I and many of us here share DOD's concerns about the legality of the hold. And I want to thank you, Ms. Cooper, for voicing DOD's concerns to the White House and pursuing the national security interests of the United States. I yield back. Mr. Radcliffe. Hey, Chairman. Um, Ms. Cooper, based on the new emails that you mentioned in your opening and then subsequent uh, declarations by some of my Democratic colleagues uh, that those emails were evidence that the Ukrainians were aware of a military hold on July 25th, there's now reporting out there saying that Pentagon official reveals Ukrainians asked about stalled security aid. Um, it's, it's being widely reported that uh, Ukraine asked about the hold on military aid on July 25th. That's not what I heard from you. Is that correct? Sir, my exact words were that one email said that the Ukrainian embassy <coughs> and the House Foreign Affairs Committee are asking about security assistance. 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 Not hold. And then the second email was the Hill knows about the FMF situation to an extent, and so does the Ukrainian embassy. Those are the exact words. And what do security assistance and FMF situation in these emails mean? I don't want to speculate on what it means. Right. They don't necessarily mean hold, correct? Not necessarily. And isn't it true that around the same time OMB put a hold on 15 State Department and USAID accounts, including FMF? I don't know that specific detail. But you can't say one way or another whether the inquiries in these emails were about the whole. Is that fair? I cannot say for certain. All right. And you can't say one way or another whether the Ukrainians knew about the whole before August 28, 2019, when it was reported in Politico, correct? Sir, I can just tell you that it's the recollection of my staff that they likely knew, but no, I do not have a certain data point to offer you. Well, it's not unusual, is it, um, Ms. Cooper, for uh, foreign countries to inquire about foreign aid that they're expecting from the United States, is it? Sir, in my experience with the Ukrainians, they typically would call about specific things, not just generally checking in on their assistance package. Are you aware that President Zelensky on uh, October 10th, in response to questions from more than 300 reporters over the course of the afternoon, stated that he was not aware and had no knowledge of a hold on security assistance during the time of his July 25th phone call with President Trump. I believe I saw that media reporting, yes. I yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you both for being here this evening. Ambassador Hale, last week the country watched as President Trump attacked and intimidated uh, your colleague. He attempted to intimidate your colleague, Ambassador Yovanovitch, who is, of course, a witness to this proceeding. And subsequently, Secretary Pompeo declined to condemn that attack. Bluntly put, I think Secretary's, Secretary Pompeo's uh, silence is nothing less than a betrayal of the men and the women whom he swore an oath to lead. And it's, it's a betrayal that has long-term consequences. 
to attracting and retaining workforce, to their morale, to their effectiveness, and to their overall strength. So, Ambassador Hale, I want to give you an opportunity to now do what Secretary Pompeo did not do, either in March of 2019 when the vicious smear campaign kind of got kicked into high gear and you, sir, rightfully pressed for a strong statement in support of her, or last week when the President and his son attacked her again. I'm offering you the opportunity to reaffirm to this committee and the millions of Americans, hopefully, who are watching that Marie Yovanovitch is a dedicated and courageous patriot and that she served with grace and dignity even in the face of that orchestrated and unsubstantiated smear attack against her. Ambassador Hale, I'm giving you the opportunity to demonstrate leadership. I'm giving you the opportunity to send a clear and resounding message to the men and women who serve in dangerous foreign posts throughout the globe that what happened to Marie Yovanovitch was wrong. Ambassador Hale, the floor is yours. Thank you, Congressman. <clears throat> Excuse me, I endorse entirely your description of Ambassador Yovanovitch. Um, I only met her when I took this job, uh, but immediately I understood that we had an exceptional officer doing exceptional work at a very critical embassy in Kyiv. Um, and during my visit to Kyiv, I was very impressed by what she was doing there to the extent that I asked her if she'd be willing to stay, if that was a possibility, because we had a gap coming up. I support and believe in the institution and the people of the State Department. I am one of them. I have been for 35 years. All of us are committed to America's national security, and we are the best group of diplomats anywhere in the world. And that support extends to all state officers who have testified before this committee. If I may, I'd like to read a letter that the Undersecretary for Management wrote on November 18 to the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in response to a communication from him. A number of department employees have testified before the House of Representatives during its inquiry regarding Ukraine. No employee has faced any adverse action by the department for testimony before Congress on this matter. The department will not discipline any department employee for appearing before Congress in response to a subpoena. The department has also proactively established a program to provide financial assistance with respect to private counsel legal fees incurred by department employees. There's additional information, but that's the essence of the message. Ambassador Hale, then, therefore, are you saying Marie Ivanovich is a dedicated and courageous patriot? I endorse what you say exactly. I think and that she served with grace and dignity in the face of the smear campaign? Yes, she did. And that what happened to her was wrong? I believe that she should have been able to stay at post and continue to do the outstanding work. And what happened to her was wrong? That's right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying the record, because I wasn't sure where it was that she could go to set the record straight if it wasn't you, sir, or where she could go to get her good name and reputation back if it weren't, if it wasn't you, sir. Indeed, I want to encourage you in the strongest terms possible. Stand your ground. America's security and strength and prosperity is predicated in no small part on the professionalism of our Foreign Services That's Corps. Right. That's and they right. need to know that you, as the highest ranking professional diplomat in the entire State Department, have their back, sir. Yes. Thank you for having Ambassador Yovanovitch's back this evening. Yes. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Ms. Cooper, the, um, who, who, uh, why did the Office of Management and Budget uh, put a hold on the funds? Sir, the only uh, information that I received was from uh, the Office of Management and Budget that they were operating at the direction of the president and they reported that he had concerns about corruption. That is all that I knew. Right, you put that in your testimony. The president had directed the Office of Management and Budget to hold the funds because of his concerns about corruption in Ukraine. Very legitimate reason. You agree? That is the this the statement that the president uh, reportedly 
made as reported to me by the Office of Management and Budget. And then you said in your testimony that based on recommendations from me and other key DOD advisors, the Department of Defense, in coordination with the Department of State, certified in May of 2019 that Ukraine had taken the steps necessary and you certified the release of the dollars. Is that accurate? That is correct, sir. But there was, you know, there was a small change in Ukraine in the spring of 2019, wasn't there? Yes, sir. Yeah, and can you elaborate on what that change was? The government of, uh, well, President Zelensky was elected to government. Yeah, you got a brand new guy coming in. In fact, he had just been, I believe, <laughs> sworn in the day you approved the, the dollars. Was it May 23rd? I think he was sworn in, on, I guess it was a couple days before. But there's sort of a sort of a change in circumstances that it seemed to me would warrant at least maybe a second look. Um, and that's exactly what played out for a short time, less than two months, 55 days. The our government evaluated the new situation, pretty radical change. You got a new government. Um, in fact, the previous one, we've heard all kinds of things from from the Democrats about the prosecutor general and the Poroshenko regime, Mr. Lutsenko, and how bad he was. So it took a while for that to that all to happen. New presidents sworn in. Two months later, the new Congress comes in. Takes them a while to. It's not until September, September fifth, that they get rid of this prosecutor, and just a few days later, the aid actually gets released. Um, but the Democrats got all kinds of other things they want to talk about. But the, the, the way this played out seems to me as logical as you can. You can do it, and particularly when you put it in the broader framework of where this president is on concern about foreign aid, his deep-rooted concern in the corruption issue in Ukraine, the experience he had with high-ranking Ukrainian officials criticizing him and supporting Secretary Clinton in the 2016 election, put all that together, sort of it shows why it played out the way it did. That I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Under Secretary Hale, I want to go back uh, to your support uh, and affirmation of uh, I was just about a bogus, bogus kid. What I understand, and, and by the way, thank you for that. You know, our military leaves nobody on, no soldier on the battlefield, and I think uh, those who are in leadership positions in the State Department and our intelligence community have that bond of loyalty to each other, and it's uh, very reassuring uh, that you represent that. You first, as I understand it, uh, got information about her situation uh, in March. Uh, by early March, Secretary Pompeo had mentioned that sometime in the fall he'd received a letter from a former member of Congress with complaints about the ambassador, correct? And that, correct. Member, that member of Congress was? Uh, Congressman Sessions. And did you see that there was any basis to the claims of disloyalty? And no, I did not, nor did the Secretary of State. All right. And you visited Kiev, and you discussed, in fact, extending Ambassador Ivanovich's term until uh, to remain at her post, right? It was a personal idea of mine, yes. Uh, obviously an indication that you valued her continued service there. And you also stated to the uh, Ukrainian press that Ambassador Yovanovitch represents the President of the United States here in the Ukraine, and America stands behind her statements, obviously trying to give her some public support, correct? Correct. Uh, and yet weeks later, the President and Mr. Giuliani unleashed what can only be characterized as an ugly smear campaign to, uh, to, to oust her. Uh, what was your reaction to the news articles in late March in which a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor attacked the ambassador? Well, we were concerned. We put out a statement that uh, some of these allegations are an outright fabrication as they related to the do not prosecute list. Right. And we began to discuss what we could do to deal with this matter. Right. And then the, the problems continued for Ambassador Yovanovitch. Uh, and as I understand it, she emailed you on March 24th and indicated that, quote, the tempo of social media and other criticisms were such that she felt she could no longer function unless there was a strong statement of defense of her from the State Department. Uh, is that correct? Correct. 
And this message, what, and Secretary Pompeo was aware uh, of her situation. Is that correct? Yes, I briefed him the next day. And he's the ultimate authority who could issue that strong statement of support, correct? Correct. Uh, but he never, ever did issue a statement, right? We did not issue a statement at that time. But in fact, you, as I, you testified around the same time that the secretary did not render assistance to a long-serving and highly respected ambassador. He made two phone calls uh, to Rudy Giuliani. Is that right? Uh, it's correct that he, I've seen a record that he made those phone calls. One on March 28 and again the next day on March 29. I saw the record of that, yes. Right. So we don't know what he said to Rudy Giuliani, but we have a pretty good idea what Rudy, Rudy Giuliani said to him. Get rid of Yovanovitch. She was gone and the statement never came forward, right? Correct. And when she was recalled uh, and wanted to find out what happened, uh, Secretary Pompeo would not meet with her? Right. I was out of the country at the time. I can't comment on that. All right. Well, and then uh, Mr. Breckbuehl, who was next in line, didn't meet with her? I, I don't know this. When well, it came for you to give her the news. It went to the, the deputy secretary, I believe, held the meeting. I was uh, in, on foreign travel at the time. Well, it would be interesting if we could have uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, be here uh, to t tell us uh, what his conversations were with Rudy Giuliani, the person who was uh, fomenting uh, the discontent about an ambassador who was fighting corruption. Uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank Ms. Cooper for your service. Mr. Maloney. Um, Hello, Ms. Cooper. Hello, Secretary Hale. Um, Ms. Cooper, thank you for working late on a Wednesday. Um, I think the last time we attempted to hear your testimony, the Republicans were good enough to bring pizza um, down to the skiff. Uh, but uh, kidding aside, I, um, I know we de detained you for about five hours that day. So on behalf of uh, the committee, thank you for your forbearance. We do appreciate your patience with us. Uh, quick question um, uh, for you, and, and I think just one question for you, Secretary Hale. Um, uh, Ms. Cooper, was DOD able to uh, put all the security system funds into contract before the end of the fiscal year? No, sir. And how much was were they not able to obligate? Um, what was left unobligated? I believe the figure was thirty-five million. It's uh, we were able to actually obligate eighty-eight percent total. And I think you mentioned that you were able because of legislation the Congress passed, continuing resolution to do that. Is that right? So the remainder, we are in the process of obligating right now because of the uh, the provision in the continuing resolution. Right. So, it, but for a, literally an act of Congress, you couldn't have spent all the money. If we had not received the provision in uh, the continuing resolution, uh, we would have uh, obligated 88%, but not the full amount. Right. Which, of course, um, would be a violation of law to not spend money that Congress appropriated. Sir, I am not a lawyer, but that is my understanding. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Secretary Hale, where were you born? Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and uh, is your family from Ireland? Am no, I right about that? No, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, Strike it. Uh, another question. With respect to uh, Secretary Yovanovitch, um, you served as ambassador to, I believe, three countries? Correct. Uh, Jordan? Jordan, Lebanon, Pakistan, and Pakistan. Lebanon? And uh, while you were ambassador to those three countries, did anyone ever ask you to uh, issue a, a support praising personally the President of the United States? No. How would you have viewed such a request? It would depend on the situation, sir. Awkward. Someone said, say you went to someone and you were having a problem with your job and you said, how can I do better? And they said you should publish something personally praising the president, flattering to him. Um, would that strike you as unusual? Yes. If someone told you to go big or go home, would that change your mind? I don't quite understand the... Well, that's what Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch was treated to when she went to... Ambassador Sondland seeking advice, that, and, and she declined to do so. I believe she said it would strike her as too political. Is that consistent with the approach you, the approach you might take? 
I thought that sounds sensible, yes. Thank you. Uh, I yield the remaining time back to the chairman. Thank you both for being here. Ms. Demings. Ambassador Hale, Ms. Cooper, thank you both for being with us. Just a quick question before I uh, get into some questions about Ambassador Sondland, who we heard from today. I want to ask both of you, if President Trump uh, withheld critical military aid from Ukraine because high-ranking officials supported the president's political opponent, would you consider that an official, acceptable, appropriate action by the President of the United States? Ambassador Hale? It's not what I would advise. Ms. Cooper? No, that does not sound appropriate. Ambassador Hale, you testified that you were aware Ambassador Sondland was involving himself in matters that, and I quote, went beyond the normal wit writ of the of an ambassador to the European Union, unquote. As you understood it, who authorized Ambassador Sondland to work on Ukraine? I had no firsthand knowledge of that. I received a readout from a meeting that the President of the United States had with the delegation on May 23rd, in which the briefing I received anyway indicated that the President wanted the members of that delegation, which included Ambassador Sondland, to carry forth the policies that were discussed in the course of that meeting. So that occurred in a meeting in the Oval Office on May 23rd is where you heard that information from the readout of that a, a written readout from that, yes. You testified that, and I quote, it was clear that the members of that inaugural delegation were empowered by the president. That's what you testified. You also said, and I quote, as a practical matter, it would be Ambassador Volker and Ambassador Sondland, presumably working with Taylor, who would be the ones really doing the continual effort here. Did you understand that Ambassador Sondland had direct access to the president? Uh, I, in the few occasions in which I had conversations with Ambassador Sondland, he often would let it know that he was in direct contact with the president. That's all I knew. So you received that information directly from Ambassador Sondland, that he had direct contact with the president? In previous occasions, yes. Not, that's not related to this particular matter. Is there anything about Ambassador Sondland's role that struck you as problematic? Based on what I knew at the time, I was satisfied that this delegation was what the president wanted to have, you know, continue to pursue these policies. And I saw that Ambassador Volklin, who was a professional, had been a foreign service officer and an ambassador of distinction um, and steeped in Ukrainian affairs, was part of that group. So I had no great concerns. So what you knew at the time, you were okay with his role, but did uh, your opinion change about his, the appropriateness of his role? As I testified, I was not aware of these various activities related to negotiations over investigations, preconditions related to that. I just wasn't aware of it, so I had no reason to be making any kind of judgment one way or the other. Have you reviewed the text messages between Ambassadors Sondland and Volker? I've seen some of them that were reported in the media. Were you surprised by anything in those messages that you heard reported or personally witnessed or observed? I was surprised by what I saw in those reports in the media. I want to ensure I understand your testimony, Ambassador Hale. You believed Ambassador Sondland was empowered by the president, according to what you found out from the May 23rd meeting to work on Ukraine policy. And you said, quote, none of that really struck you as problematic because of the time differences there of what you knew. Is that correct? Based on what I knew, yes. Okay. You are the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. You testified that in that capacity, you are responsible for the management of the United States bilateral relations with, and I quote, every country in the world that we recognize for the management of our policies towards those countries, as well as our relationship or policies as they relate to multilateral organizations. Does that include U.S. policy and relations with Ukraine? 
It does, but when we have a special envoy who reports directly to the secretary related to a country or an issue, that special envoy will take the day-to-day -day responsibilities. How about U.S. policy and relations with the European Union? Yes, I am. But you were not aware fully of Ambassador Sondland's activities on behalf of President Trump? That's correct. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Mr. Krishnamurthy. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Under Secretary Hale, uh, you and your colleagues testified that you've gathered official records at the State Department with the understanding that they would be provided to Congress, right? I was not involved in the decision making or I have no responsibilities related to gathering documents. I understood that it was underway. And I, I certainly received the documents that I described earlier. I see. Um, in terms of the materials that were collected, uh, do they include electronic files and emails, for instance? I can only speak to the documents that were made available to me, and it did include emails. And uh, paper documents? As and well? paper documents. Um, would tape recordings potentially be uh, among the files that are gathered? I really couldn't uh, speculate uh, on that. But you can't rule out that possibility? I don't, I don't know of tape recordings, but I, so I can't really comment on that. And uh, are you familiar with um, uh, from whom the documents have been collected, like the individual custodians? I don't know that, sir. Um, you're aware that uh, despite a duly authorized congressional subpoena has been served on the State Department, we have yet to receive even a single document, correct? Uh, I understand that, yes. Uh, Ms. Cooper, um, in the interagency process, um, did anyone in any committee uh, uh, potentially bring up uh, the lack of allied funding as a reason for why there should be a hold on military assistance to Ukraine? I can only speak to the three uh, meetings that I attended, the, the PCC, DSG, and then PCC, and I have no recollection of the issue of allied burden sharing coming up at that point. I did provide information in my deposition about a, what I thought was a completely separate query that I received in mid-June uh, from the Secretary of Defense's front office, and one of the questions there uh, just asked a question about the degree to which uh, allies were contributing to Ukraine security assistance, just to be very clear. Okay, but after the hold was put in place on July 18th, you, did, you haven't heard any concerns about a lack of allied funding uh, as a reason for why the hold should be in place? In those meetings that I attended, I did not hear that, or I do not recall hearing that as a reason. The only reason that I Got heard it. was uh, the president's views on corruption. No further information. Got it. Same question to you, Under Secretary Hill. Could you repeat the question, sir? I assume you didn't hear about the lack of allied funding as a as a reason for the hold putting, being put in place after July 18th. No, I never heard a reason for the hold. You never, I, I assume neither of you heard any reason whatsoever for why the hold was in place, except for the fact that OMB put it in place at the direction of the president, right? That's, that's correct. And I, I assume, you know, one of my colleagues brought up the idea that the hold was put in place to assess whether or not President Zelensky was legit. I assume that was not a, uh, a reason that was offered either. No, sir, I never heard that as a reason. No, I heard no reason. Um, Under Secretary Hale, what is the importance of a world leader having a meeting at the White House? Well, really, just case by case, but um, particularly for a new leader, it's an extremely important opportunity to demonstrate the strength of our relationship for uh, building of that relationship at a personal level, leadership level, to demonstrate common goals. How about in the case of President Zelensky? Um, how important was it for him to have this white, uh, a meeting at the White House with President Trump? Well, I never talked to President Zelensky about that myself. I met him before he became president. I met with President Poroshenko and the two leading candidates. But uh, as an expert uh, on these matters, uh, is it fair to say that uh, a, a new world leader such as President Zelensky having a meeting at the White House with President Trump is extremely important for 
uh, his image that he projects, especially toward folks like uh, Russia? Well, an Oval Office meeting is incredibly valuable for any foreign leader. Let me just state that general principle. And for a Ukrainian president, it is indeed what you just said to demonstrate that the bond between the United States and Ukraine is strong and that there is continuity in our policies and that we are going to continue to work together on our policy goals, including countering Iran, uh, Russian aggression and intimidation of Ukraine. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I yield back. That concludes the member questioning. Uh, Mr. Nunes, do you have any concluding remarks? Thank the gentleman. What have we learned from the Democrats' impeachment inquiry? They promised the country a fair hearing. What have they delivered? The impeachment version of three-card Monte, notorious short con card trick where the mark, in this case, President Trump and the American public, stands no chance of winning. Democrats promised the whistleblower's testimony. In fact, they told us that we need to speak with the whistleblower. And then we learned that the whistleblower coordinated with the Democratic staff before alerting the Intelligence Community's Inspector General. To hide their con, the Democrats pound the table and gaslight the country, telling us that the whistleblower is entitled to an imaginary statutory right of anonymity. They accuse us of trying to out the whistleblower knowing that they're the only ones who know who he is. They say that if the facts are against you, argue the law. If the law is against you, argue the facts. And if both are against you, pound the table and yell like hell. It seems at law school these days, it's teaching their students a fourth tactic. If the facts and the law are against you, simply rig the game and hope your audience is too stupid to catch your duplicity. This is not an impeachment inquiry, it's an impeachment inquisition. In the Middle Ages, the Inquisitor was free to act on his own and bring suit against any person who was even vaguely the subject of the lowest rumor. And the accused was denied any right to confront their accusers. Incredibly, or maybe not so much given the Democrats' track record, an Inquisition victim had more rights than the Democrats are giving the president. After all, Inquisition victims had the right to know their accuser's name. For those of you at home, it's time to change the channel, turn down the volume, or hide the kids, put them to bed. Now I yield to Mr. Schiff for story time hour. I thank the gentleman, as always, for his uh, remarks. Um, I want to, I'll be brief this evening, it's been a long day, uh, and I said most of what I wanted to say earlier in the day, but I did want to uh, end this evening and first of all thank you both uh, for your testimony and your long service to the country. We are grateful uh, that you answered the lawful process uh, of a congressional subpoena. I wanted to share a few reflections on two words that have come up a lot in the course of these hearings. And those words are corruption and anti-corruption. We are uh, supposed to believe, I, I imagine, listening to my colleagues, that Donald Trump is a great anti-corruption fighter. That his only concern about Ukraine was that it would fight corruption. But let's look at that argument. Let's look at the president's words and look let's look at his deeds ambassador yovanovich was an anti-corruption champion no one has contradicted that that has come forward to testify here she was a champion and on the day she is at a meeting uh, acknowledging in ukraine another anti-corruption champion a woman who had acid thrown in her face and died a painful death after months, she is called back to Washington because of a vicious smear campaign by the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, among others. She is recalled, that is not anti-corruption, that is corruption. And one of the people responsible for this smear campaign, in addition to Mr. Giuliani, 
and it is a long and sordid list of those who were involved, is a man named Lutsenko, someone who the minority's own witness acknowledges uh, has a poor reputation as self-serving and corrupt. And what do we see about Mr. Lusenko and his predecessor, Mr. Shokin? What does the president have to say about one of these corrupt former prosecutors? He praises them. He says they were treated very unfairly. That's not anti-corruption. That's corruption. And when Ambassador Sondland testified today that there was unquestionably a quid pro quo and everybody knew it, conditioning a White House meeting that Ukraine desperately wanted to show its friend and foe alike it had the support of the President of the United States, when that was conditioned, that official act was conditioned on the receipt of things of value to the president, political investigations, that was not anti-corruption, that was corruption. And when Ambassador Sondland testified today that he could put two and two together, and so can we, that the, there was also a quid pro quo on the military aid, that that aid was not going to be released unless they did a public statement, Ukraine did a public statement of these political investigations the president wanted. That's not anti-corruption, that is corruption. And let's look at the president's words on that phone call, that infamous phone call on July 25th. Does he ask President Zelensky, how is that reform coming in the RADA? What are you doing to root out corruption? Uh, what about that new anti-corruption court? Of course not. Of course not. Are we really to believe that was his priority? No. What does he ask? I want you to do us a favor, a, a favor. Investigate this crazy 2016 server conspiracy that the server's somewhere in Ukraine. And more ominously, investigate the Bidens. That's not anti-corruption. That is corruption. And the next day when he's on the phone to Ambassador Sondland in that outdoor plot restaurant in Kiev, what does he want to know about? Does he want to know how Zelensky is going to fight corruption? Of course not. The only thing he brings up in that call is the investigation he wants into the Bidens. That's not anti-corruption. That is corruption. Every now and then, there's a conversation that really says all you need to know. And sometimes it doesn't seem all that significant. But I'll tell you, this one really struck me. And it was a conversation that Ambassador Volker related in his testimony. And it was a conversation just this past September when he's talking to uh, Andrei Yarmak, top advisor to President Zelensky. And he's advising him as indeed he should. You know, you may not want to go through with an investigation or prosecution of former President Poroshenko. Engaging in political investigations is really not a good idea. And you know what Yermak says? Oh, you mean like you want us to do of the Bidens and the Clintons? Well, there's a word for that, too, and it's not corruption or anti-corruption. It's called hypocrisy. And this is the problem here. We do have an anti-corruption policy around the world. And the great men and women in your department, under Secretary Hale, and in your department, Ms. Cooper, they carry that mes message around the world that the United States is devoted to the rule of law. But when they see a president of the United States who is not devoted to the rule of law, who is not devoted to anti-corruption, but instead demonstrates in word and deed corruption, they are forced to ask themselves, what does America stand for anymore? That concludes this evening's hearing. Uh, I will ask the witnesses to excuse themselves Members should remain. We have a, a business matter to take up.
have the ranking members request that I concur as chair and the ranking members request that the committee issue subpoenas pursuant to Put it this way. The television lights came up at 9 a.m. this morning and they are going down 11 hours later. Time off in between for breaks. You heard Chairman Schiff uh, end the day with his second emotional summation of the day. After the first break, he uh, his rejoinder about the president was he got caught. And tonight his rejoinder was that's not anti-corruption, that's corruption. And with that, good evening, Brian Williams here from our NBC News headquarters in New York. Day 1035 of this Trump administration, day four of these public impeachment hearings, a day that will be remembered for the blowtorch testimony early on from EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland, a political appointee of this president, let's not forget, an insider and clearly the most important witness thus far. Sondland confirmed the pressure campaign on Ukraine. He said it was well known on the inside and confirmed the plot to get information on the Bidens. Sondland today refusing to go quietly, refusing to go down alone. Instead, the first witness with a direct line of communication to the president gave testimony under oath that is a setback for this White House and instead matches the Democrats' narrative. We did not want to work with Mr. Giuliani. Simply put, we were playing the hand we were dealt. The suggestion that we were engaged in some irregular or rogue diplomacy is absolutely false. As I testified previously, Mr. Giuliani's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. We worked with Mr. Giuliani because the President directed us to do so. Again, there was no secret regarding moving forward and the discussion of investigations. Again, everyone's in the loop. I know that members of this committee frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. Now, it bears noting that even before Sondland had finished his testimony today, the president used a time-honored technique of his and started distancing himself from his own political appointee, a man who gave his inauguration effort $1 million, Gordon Sondland, saying he, quote, hardly knows the gentleman. It's a talking point the president first used about a week ago. And Sondland was just the first half of this marathon day. Just this evening, we heard testimony from senior Pentagon official Laura Cooper and the number three official at state, David Hale. In something of a surprise, Ms. Cooper, the senior Pentagon official, made some news. Apparently, after the transcript of her closed-door deposition was released to the public, Ms. Cooper's own staff came to her to flag new information she didn't previously know. As early as July 25th, uh, the same day President Trump spoke with President Zelensky on the phone and uh, asked for this favor, uh, the same day that President Zelensky thanked the United States for its military support and signaled it was ready to purchase more javelins. On that date, um, you got inquiries, your staff got inquiries from someone at the Ukrainian embassy uh, who was concerned about the status of the military assistance. Is that correct? Sir, that's correct. I would say that specifically the Ukrainian embassy staff asked what is going on with Ukrainian security assistance. And did that uh, connote to you that they were concerned that something was in fact going on with it? Yes, sir. You are now, Ms. Cooper, the third witness uh, before our committee who has testified that the Ukrainians found out about the problem or hold on the security assistance prior to it becoming public. But you're the first to indicate that that may go back as early as the date of the president's call with President Zelensky. More on that moment in a moment. It's also not the first time that new information has come to light since these hearings have been underway. Now, the afternoon session of testimony started late and just wrapped up this evening, as you know, and it was only the first event of our day as we are preparing for tonight's Democratic presidential debate. 
Moderated by our colleagues Andrea Mitchell, Rachel Maddow, Kristen Welker, and Ashley Parker, Pulitzer Prize winning White House reporter for the Washington Post. And with the testimony in Washington still fresh, yes, we are going to soon turn our attention to Atlanta, Georgia. Ten Democratic presidential contenders are getting ready to walk out on that stage at Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta. And again, less than two hours, the debate will get underway, capping off what has been a riveting day. We want to bring the conversation back to our studio in New York, bring the conversation back to what it is we have just witnessed. Let's bring in former U.S. Attorney, Senior FBI Official Chuck Rosenberg, MSNBC Chief Legal Correspondent Ari Melber, and Washington Post Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Eugene Robinson. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Again, a long day's journey in tonight. Chuck Rosenberg, let's, uh, let's start at the end and work our way back. That last revelation, uh, an email comes in to her staff the date should stick in people's minds by now. This proves the Ukrainians were aware of what? Well, it shows that the Ukrainians knew, at least suspected, Brian, that there had been an, a hold put on the security assistance that they so desperately needed. One of the interesting things from today, we learned again, uh, in this case from uh, David Hale, the third ranking um, person at the State Department, how important uh, security assistance was for Ukraine. They were invaded in 2014 by Russia. 14,000 Ukrainians have died since then in that conflict. Uh, and the President of the United States, according to Mr. Sumland, who testified earlier, is conditioning receipt of security assistance uh, on the Ukrainians making a political announcement to benefit the President. Uh, Ari Melber, as a practical political matter, where it comes to messaging on the part of the Democrats. You asked this evening on the air why this wasn't being billed as the plot against the Bidens instead. Exactly, because what we see here is people who work for Donald Trump now confirming, they say, that this was a tit for tat, a quid pro quo, a extortion bribe, whatever you want to call it, to go after Biden. And it was all about the Bidens. And then you had this debate a little bit in the hearing about which Ukrainian company reflected that, but it was all about the Bidens. So we're going to see that on the base stage tonight. For people who are catching up with today's hearings, Brian, I would put it simply. In the morning, we heard Donald Trump's own appointee, who still works for him, say, yes, we tried to use money to extort Ukraine to help us go after Biden. And in the afternoon, we saw other officials, including at the Pentagon, confirm, yes, the Ukrainians knew the money was on the line. Uh, while I have you on the subject of Sondland, which is a gentleman who's still going to uh, occupy a lot of our time here tonight, uh, all we know is he mentioned flying back to Brussels. He was spotted indeed at Dulles Airport this afternoon, having made his flight presumably, and presumably he's perhaps enjoying dinner over the North Atlantic tonight. He'll still be an employee when he lands. Talk about the impact of his words and how shocking it was this morning that he was going in. This was an actually incredible day. Gordon Sondland is the Trump donor. He is handpicked by Donald Trump. And unlike many other people in the administration, he has one-to-one -one contact with Trump. We've heard this question posed in the hearings up until today. Did you talk to the president about it? Did you hear the president say it? This is a person who today repeatedly said, yes, I talked to the president. I did it on the president's orders. And he says it was a quid pro quo bribery campaign to get Ukraine to help take out and hurt Joe Biden, hurt the Bidens, go after them. So having Gordon Sondland be a Trump person, talked about never Trump, up until today, Brian, he was always Trump. And he just dropped a dime on the president of the United States, and he still, as of tonight, is employed by Trump. Eugene Robinson, we were on the air last night in this very studio. Uh, as we put it, he had a whole lot of explaining to do today. Yeah. And there was, there's been a robust discussion as to whether or not he would take the fifth, in fact, Right. He did, I guess, the opposite of that. He did absolutely the opposite. I mean, he, he did, you know, um, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. I mean, he was, he was, he, he came with that big sort of um, smile on his face. He was ready to, to tell his story. He believes in his story, and he believes, um, it's, it's interesting, he, he emphasized a couple of points. First of all, this was 
the official policy of the president of the United States mm -hmm. he was uh, enacting. It wasn't some sort of rogue campaign. Everybody was in on it, on it. Everybody knew what was going on, despite what they might tell you. Everybody was in the loop. Um, the other thing that really struck me that, that he said was that it didn't actually matter if the Ukrainians actually investigated. It was that they announced an investigation. Yeah. That was the whole point, was to get the announcement of the investigation. Um, and the Sondland testimony was so full and so, you know, it was long, but it, but it had so much in it that we really should not overlook the Laura Cooper testimony um, this evening, because that point about um, when the Ukrainians knew that the aid wasn't coming. Now, if you think about it, for five minutes, how would they not know, right? I mean, how would you not know that $400 million in military aid that you desperately need had not arrived on time, that it had been approved, and usually it, it, it shows up? Yeah, you're looking I mean, at FedEx every day, hoping the check is coming. Exactly. You look in your, in your, in your bank account on payday, and if, you're, and, and if you're, your salary isn't there, you notice. And if you're Ukraine, absolutely you notice. Well, we got confirmation of what you could have assumed. But yes, they noticed. They knew the money wasn't there, and they knew something was up. Uh, Chuck Rosenberg, uh, Eugene mentioned Sondland's kind of confident air and smile. Sean Patrick Maloney, Democrat of New York, later called it a smirk in his view, and that is also to say Sondland angered, uh, found a way to anger members of both parties today. The Republicans made some headway in their redirect, and I think that's what made the congressman from New York angry. Uh, Ambassador Sondland was the strongest when he read his opening statement. Over the course of the day, it seemed like he wore down a bit. He migrated. He, he, he migrated, but that's not the first time this has happened to that particular gentleman. Remember, this was essentially, as the congressman pointed out, the third iteration of his statement. Right? Each time it's gotten a little bit sharper, his recall has gotten mm -hmm. a little bit better. When that happens, as a former federal prosecutor, your antenna immediately go up. Is he just remembering more stuff, innocently, as we sometimes do? Or is he coloring or shading his testimony in some way, particularly if he's had access to what other people have said? So there was stuff that was quite damning of the president early on. And again, as we discussed, it softened a bit as the day went on. And Brian, today, Gordon Sondland, as an appointee and a current employee of the president, confirmed publicly under oath that there was quid pro quo bribery. And he hasn't been removed from office. Just think about that tonight. Night is still young. But, but that's an endorsement that the White House is currently leaving on the table. Absolutely. Uh, 8, 11 uh, p.m. Eastern time. For those just joining us, we are talking about this momentous day of testimony, obviously. Also, obviously, in less than an hour, we're going to go live to the uh, Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta for tonight's Democratic debate. As usual, for us in the spin room, it wouldn't be the same without him. Chris Matthews at his post in Atlanta. Chris, I don't remember being this preoccupied with a, a similarly political matter on the day of a debate going into a debate night. We'll see how it works. I think uh, certainly our viewers and yours as well have been fascinated by the prosecution of this impeachment effort, uh, fascinated by it. They don't really want to change topics, really. We'll see that tonight, in a weird way, uh, the, the impeachment audience will be brought right into the uh, debate chamber tonight. So in a way, they're going to meet each other. Uh, it's fascinating. I, I got to tell you, I was loving what Ari Melber said a moment ago about conversions. If I were the president sitting upstairs in the White House tonight with Milani or whoever else is still in this circle, I'd be worried that all this conversion's going on. These people, as you point out, Ambassador Sondland, going back to his post in Brussels, still on the payroll, uh, testifying basically the president committed the crime today, saying it was a quid pro quo. You know, and I think uh, the, the circle they described today and the, and the chairman described there's such a wide circle of people involved in this this escapade uh, the chief of staff the secretary of state uh the uh, of course as well the acting uh, uh, director of uh, uh, office of management and budget all these members of the state department all involved in this quid pro quo and i think where the uh, democrats have an advantage is the medium we're on right now because 
as Ari as well said a moment ago, these opening statements are so well written. They're so well written for television. They, key, they had the key moment in there where he said it is basically a quid pro quo when it was all directed by the president. All this is going to be video evidence going into the uh, Judiciary Committee and then for the House floor and then for the Senate trial. All this video supporting the charge that something would be the basis of the first article of impeachment, which is abuse of power. And all the Republicans can do is do scatter shots, they can do some skirmishing, but they can't get rid of those videos of what the Democrats are able to get in the first hour or so of each morning of testimony. It's like television is going to help the Democrats, Brian. All right, Chris, don't move. Uh, we're going to fit in our first break uh, by way of thanking our co-counsel, our two lawyers who have been with us for our coverage all day long for all of it. I'm watching the clock, too. We're coming up on 12 hours. Uh, we'll be right back. Our coverage of the post-hearing coverage and the pre